and welcome to the second in the roundtable series on pension reform for the 21st century, being run for Business Today in 10 Alps. Uh, we're looking at the role of corporates and the responsibility of corporates in the world that we're about to enter. And I'm joined on the panel from uh, on my right by Pete Glancy, who's Head of Corporate Propositions at Scottish Widows, uh, by Joanne Seegers, who is Chief Executive of the National Association of Pension Funds, Caroline Rooks, who is Director of Private Pensions at the Department for Work and Pensions, and Maria Lopez, uh, who is a senior policy advisor with the Confederation for British Industry. Uh, the first issue we're going to talk about is what are the challenges ahead for the larger corporates as they, we enter this new world of auto enrolment later this year? Pete, what do you think they are? Well, I think uh, the, the challenges break into three main headings. The first is, is one around uh, governance in terms of determining the, the right type of pension uh, which to use for auto enrolment, and for that, that breaks down between companies who already have a pension scheme and companies who don't. And for those companies that do have a pension scheme, do they continue to use the same pension scheme for some or all of their workforce, or do they look for an, an alternative? Um, perhaps the the biggest logistical challenge, of course, is looking at the the end-to-end -end operating model and processes and systems that are required. Um, we've, we've got a, quite, quite a complex set of processes, but there is technology solutions that are being developed that will take a lot of that complexity away. But what employers need to do is they need to look at the payroll and admin systems that they have, whatever technology solutions they may be bringing in to help them with auto-enrollment and also the third-party administrators or pension providers, look at the end-to-end -end operating model and, uh, and work with their partners to set that up in a way that's, uh, that, that's comprehensive and, and, and uh, reduces the, the administrative burden. And the third thing for me is really around employee engagement. It's important that you get effective employee engagement if you're going to get uh, auto uh, enrolment opt-in rates you know, as high as you can. Mm -hmm. And it's also important that uh, if you're going to get people to do more than the de minimis contribution levels, you have an effective uh, employee engagement regime that puts pensions into a meaningful context for, for those people as individuals. Yeah. Joanne, more you add to that? Yeah, I mean, I think Pete's picked up on a number of very important points. I think the key point for corporates is to be prepared. Mm. Um, it is a really quite complex process, and it will take uh, a lot of thinking through some of those processes around auto enrolment, who are your eligible employees. And I think the sooner corporates start thinking about that, the better, really, mm. so that people are prepared. And I think Pete raises the other very important issue, which is about employee communications. Mm. Uh, making sure that uh, we are communicating clearly and effectively with employees who will be brought into auto enrolment, most of whom may not have saved in a pension ever before mm -hmm. in their lives. So getting through that process, getting through the end-to-end, the -end, as Pete calls it, process, working ahead of time, making sure that we're uh, well prepared, and then making sure that employees are going to be ready for that uh, moment when they start, find themselves in a pension scheme mm -hmm. is going to be vitally important. Yeah. Mario, what do you think? And, and can I just raise one point? I, I, I have a slight impression that the really big companies who were first in mm -hmm. are kind of more or less there. Yeah. But there's a huge tranche of still very big companies who are coming in quite early next year yeah. who seem to me not so well prepared. That's absolutely right. I think, you know, both what Pete and, and Joanne have said is absolutely right. It's, um, I think the major thing is it's a, it's a complex new regime that a lot of employers haven't yet uh, um, fully understood the, the implications of how much change they're going to have to bring, bring it in. And the first uh, tranche of employers coming in is actually quite well prepared. They were aware they have, there's been a lot of work being done by both the government and the regulator to get them ready for this. And obviously, because they're large, they have a lot of advice that they can provide. But I think there is a, a slight um, problem where oh, almost the, 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 the number of employers who are coming in, as you said, very quickly, straight after the first wave, they might not have realized how quickly this process is going to be coming in. And they need to be very much on top of the detail very quickly on, because it's not something you can uh, get ready for in weeks. You will need months to make sure that everything is absolutely right. But it's also the important bit about the, the employee side and employee engagement side is saying to a lot of people who are not having started saving in a pension before, is suddenly they're going to start realizing that some money is going to be deducted from the, from the pay, the, the, the monthly pay, and they're going to start asking questions. Mm -hmm. Where is this money going to? Which is, where, where, is, where is the money going in? I mean, they're going to get a package from the pension provider or the, or the, or the trust board, and they might not have read about it. Mm -hmm. And suddenly they realize that they don't have as much money as the month before that one. So it's important that employers are preparing it well in advance and knowing where the staging date is and having time to get ready, mm -hmm. but also that they are communicating with their employees about what the reality of this is. Mm -hmm. And it's not just about a cost for them, but it's also about the 
potential benefit for both their employees, but also in the overall benefit package that they're going to be offered in terms of recruitment and retention. Yeah. And does that reflect what? I think how it looks from where you sit. It does reflect um, how we see it. Um, your other members of the panel have set out quite comprehensively what the issues are for employers. And we must remember that the biggest employers that are going first, which we hope are in the best position, are going to be the ones that bring in the most people. Mm. So it's very important to us that they get it right, uh, as well as the next tranche, obviously. And we're trying to make sure that we have as much guidance and information out there for them as we can possibly get. Um, the other thing that uh, we're very keen to do is to hear from the first corporates as they go live so that we can learn from their experience so that when the next lot are coming on, mm. if there are things we can do to make life easier for them, to help them in any way, then we want to learn from that. But it is a very, very big change and mm. we shouldn't lose sight of that and lose sight of the prize, which we hope is a future where we do have everybody saving in a pension and 1.3 million employers providing pensions. Yeah, right, right. Well, where, where do we think Nest is going to end up in all this? Um, I mean, they, you know, at the beginning there was kind of Nest, and nothing else, and not, no, no else is much interested in the very bottom end of the market. We've now got, you know, now coming in as a, as a new entrant in that, we've got legal and general involved, uh, so there are other, other people offering at the bottom end of the market. What, what, what do we think might happen? Well, I mean, I, th I think, you know, the NAPF has always been very, very supportive of NES and very enthusiastic about the development of NES. It's right that there are, there are participants and not just a single participant operating at that part of the market and frankly you know there are up to eight million employees coming into mm. nest uh, coming into auto enrollment um, so there's plenty to go around for everybody and i think you know nest i'm sure will be successful and i think it's right that there are other providers who sit alongside that to create you know a little bit of tension a little bit of competition so that we make sure that you know the products the prices stay pretty keen mm. and focused on the, the target market yeah I think the, the employer base is, is polarised. We have an existing employer base who see pensions as an important part of an employee benefit package. They're often very parental, uh, they're often very generous in the contribution levels. And uh, I think that a lot of the existing products that are on the market from the traditional big brand providers are built for that end of the market. They, they, they are quite sophisticated. They're not designed for the auto enrolment market where people may have lower contribution levels. They may be more transient, shorter periods of service. And I think that a more standardised, lower cost proposition is, is ideal for that end of the market. Equally, I think it's good that uh, people at the, the auto enrolment end of the market have, have, have the same sort of choice that people at the employee benefits end do. So I, I welcome some of the new entrants coming into the market, but it is critical that we have a provider of, of last resort with a public service obligation. So it is, it is critical that NEST mm. succeeds. Yeah. I, think, I think that's absolutely right. And I think there's, um, one of the main issues for us has been the certification process. It's something Sylvia has worked a lot in, and is making sure that the process allows, if you already have an, 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 a, a, a provider in place, and it's a good provider, mm. that you should be able very simply to actually certify that. Because what we don't want to see is a leveling down because you just simply, um, the, the process is so complex that, that the cost of it, it just means that it's, it's, it's higher than actually just leveling down. So Nest is a, it's good to have competition in the market. It's good that you know, they've done a lot of very good work in terms of simplifying communication, offering more accessibility, etc. And that is good and it's been very helpful. Um, but we also have a, a privately provided uh, market in place who's been working for many years that they know the business very well and we need to make sure that those schemes are working well now. Mm -hmm. The employer is able to certify them and continue using them. So that is a crucial part of, of, of the entire regime. Yeah. As Joanne said, I mean, there's no intention that Nest will take over the whole market. It was designed particularly for small employers and for low and moderate earners, but not exclusively for them. But that's the, the target market for it. And as Steve said, it's got um, an obligation to take anybody who comes. So nobody has to use it, but it can't turn anybody away, unlike other providers in the market. But uh, we are very keen that other providers come along, but that Nest continues to have the positive pressure that it seems to have had in terms of charges coming down and simplicity around messages and languages. Mm. Well, one of, the, one of the big worries when this was being designed was, was, was whether it would lead to levelling down in the sense mm. that employers bring their contributions for the existing employees down towards the pretty minimal levels you have to put in. Is there any evidence that's happening? 
We've not, we've not seen that in our, our book at the moment, but I think that maybe comes from a bit of a misunderstanding around the, the current pensions that are set up. Pensions are set up as an employee benefit to help attract and retain you know, core staff with mm -hmm. core skills. Levelling down those benefits, it is, uh, from our research, still the most valued employee benefit. It wouldn't make any commercial sense for an employer to, to level down contributions for those core staff. Yeah. I think that's right that it is. You know, we, we produce survey evidence that shows amongst employees after their pay, a pension is the most valued employee benefit. But I think for employers facing, you know, who mm. in the current economic environment are under significant uh, financial pressures, some employers will say, well, actually, this is my budget for pensions and it has to be spread more thinly. But what we've been tracking through our annual surveys over the last three or four years is this very question of levelling down. And what we've seen since auto enrolment was first mooted, is fewer employers saying they're likely to mm. level down. And that, I think, is very encouraging as the rules have become clearer, as the terms of engagement have become clearer. Now, I'm not going to say that no employer will level down. I think some, some will because they'll simply have to because they're under such financial pressures. Mm. But I think the numbers who, who are first considering levelling down is now lower mm. than, it, than it once was. But it's something we'll all have to track, and it's something I know the government wants to track, and we will want to track as NAPF as we go through this, because you know, an outcome that says, well, there are more save savers but, but less mm. saving isn't necessarily the outcome that mm. we all want. And have we, have we reached the stage yet where, I mean, the, ob the obvious risk for that sort of thing, something like the large retailers, where they have huge turnover of staff, they have lots of staff who aren't in pensions, it seems to me they'd be the obvious people to be tempted to... Well, I will we'll have to see, you know, lots of those will be the first that, mm. that do go through auto enrolment in sort of the back end of this year. Yeah. And we'll have to see. But I think certainly my sense speaking to a number of those is that that's not really where they are. They do want to remain good employers. Mm. They do. They are in pretty keen competition with each other mm. for staff, even in today's, today's labour market. Um, so I don't get that sense. Yeah. No, absolutely no. I think, I think within the retail industry, there is... A lot of inter because they have a lot of experience of high turnover of staff, and I think the three-month waiting period exactly. that allows them to, um, you know, short-term staff in peak seasons like Christmas, etc., um, because they have that that sort of more flexible model that it will allow them for say, you know, there's a difference between the very short-term staff that just stays in for a couple of weeks because mm. of high volume of work and your long-term employee. And I think there's a, a crucial distinction that the three-month waiting period has been very useful in actually making sure that you divide those two groups because the two-week worker, it might not necessarily be the first person interested on the pension. Mm. Uh, and, the, and the employment needs to make sure that you know, there's su sufficient administrative simplicity to be able to cater for the long-term yeah. employee. Yeah, very much uh, in line with the research we've done, which suggests that employers are not intending to level down. Yeah. Some may, we can't stop them. Uh, but in some cases um, where they are levelling down, it may not be for the whole workforce. It might just be, for example, for those that are there for a short period of time. And if they've got a pension at a lower rate, that's better than no. nothing. Yeah. Uh, but as Joanne says, we want to monitor, monitor it very carefully, not least because I think we all accept that the 8% minimum contribution is a starting point. Mm. It's not the end point. Let's get everybody starting to save, and then we can look at trying to increase the level at which they're saving at. Yeah, right. The other thing that you hear a bit is that you know, the ban on transfers in and out and the cap uh, is posing some problem for employers in trying to design what, what it is they want to do in that they can't move everybody over easily and you know, they're going to end up with running more than one pension scheme. Is that proving a problem in practice? From an S perspective, from within yeah. NEST, um, I think I think that there might be, there's a bit, people are more relaxed now about the, the, the cap and the, and the ban on transfer and whether, you know, for example, select committee sort of recommended to, to, for them to be lifted. Um, having said that, this is a complex regime and we have had set up some signposts in the way. Uh, and I think it is important that we stick to those, uh, to, to that timeline, to be able to provide that certainty. So I think most people will be, are more relaxed about you know, whether those could be lifted. Mm -hmm. But if we have an agreement at the beginning in a very complex system, it is important we honour them so everyone is at the same point at every step of the way and it creates a certainty and that sort of confidence among, among, mm. among both employees, providers and employees as well. Yeah. Peter, you, you've done some, you're doing some partnering work with NES, aren't you? Is it, yes, we... we, we and transfers a problem? We, we very much see um, 
uh, working with uh, Nest and, and other, other companies such as the People's Pension has, has been complementary to our proposition at, at around the end of the market. Um, that, that's, that, that seems to be all right when you're looking at a two-tier solution where, where we're sitting with maybe the head office team and uh, within the workforce and, and Nest are sitting with uh, maybe the, the shop floor, floor team. For a smaller company though, for example, that's just looking at a single product provider, I, th I think that uh, the, the restrictions on Nest could, could uh, hinder an employer from picking Nest when uh, all other things being equal, they may want to pick Nest as their preferred solution. Mm. I mean, I'm, I'm personally in favour of informed choice and a level playing field. I think it would be easier uh, if the restrictions on Nest weren't there, uh, albeit there are some competitors at that end of the market who, who might see that as an unfair advantage. But as I say, we don't operate at that end of the market. I, I think it's a, a bit of a hindrance for Nest. Yeah, I agree with Mario that, you know, actually people are much more relaxed now about lifting the, the ban on transfers and, and the uh, salary cap, the contributions cap. Um, and, you know, I think we all, we're all agree that actually mm. in 2017 that those, those bans will be lifted. And I think that's perfectly right. Um, Does, wouldn't it make sense to lift them now, though, if you're going to be lifted in 2017? Well, and, and when the Select Committee made the recommendations out of effect, we said, yeah, you know, why not? Life has moved on since those rules were first introduced, but I think there are some legal impediments to, to doing that. Mm. Um, having said that, you know, we really think by 2017 they should have, they should have gone. Mm. Um, but I think, you know, you, you said, well, aren't, won't employers end up running two or three pension mm. schemes? And those employers who've already got pension schemes mm. are running two, three, four, five yeah, pension sure. schemes in many cases. But I accept that for those who are new to pensions, it will be more of a limitation. But actually, that's why it's good we've had these other market entrants coming in at the lower end of the mm. uh, market to really help service some of those, uh, you know, some of those employers' mm. needs. Right, right. I mean, one of their sales pitches will be that, that you know, if you, if you went into Nest, you can't get out at the moment, 2017, so you can't transfer out, um, which won't, might not be good for Nest's market share and you know, Nest doesn't need a minimum market share to be viable. Sure, but again, you know, there are up to 8 million people who, who are out there who yeah. will come in, 1.3 million employers. As I said before, there's plenty to go around, yeah. it seems to me. Right. And we are looking at them. Um, yeah. As John said, there are legal impediments to just lifting them, but we are looking at them and we are committed to lifting them in 2017. Right. And a sort of final question around this is, does anybody have any sense, any more accurate sense of what the opt-out rate might be? when this comes in. Well, we produced some survey evidence last autumn that said maybe one in three, and I, mm. I very much hope that's wrong. I hope it's, you know, much more positive than that. Yeah. We've just completed a survey of, uh, of 5,000 people uh, with an annual survey we do, and we've had some specific questions on auto-enrolment and opt-out rates this year. And for, for all the population who are going to be auto-enrolled that answered the question, 60% said they would stay in. But I suppose by default, that means the rest are either unsure or they might opt out. So it's, uh, it's still in that, that region of a third, I think. Right. I, th I think the, the most important thing is this is, is, is a long-term regime that's going to be in place through economic cycles. So we shouldn't be panicking. Obviously, the current economic situation means that incomes are under pressure. So a lot of people might be opting out at higher rates than we expected when Turner um, yeah. produced that report. But the truth is that even if they weren't to come in today, there is a periodical... Be three years again, in, exactly. three Exactly. And, and, and the good thing about that is it goes through economic cycles, so when the economy picks up, we might see more numbers coming in. So, you know, we are not... The most important thing is we don't try to panic and start doing quick fixes to try to get the numbers up, but rather we have the certainty in place, the regime is going through, and eventually we are pretty sure that we will see numbers coming up once the economy picks up and people have a bit more money to spare. But, you know, we shouldn't be panicking if we see that the first numbers are not as good as we expected because yeah. in 2005 no one expected the, the current situation today. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a bit about, you know, the, 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 the economic circumstances at, at some point yeah. in time. Has the department done anything recently on what? Uh, it's, uh, we're constantly researching what people's intentions are yeah. and we still maintain the top out rates or probably, well, we have a range, but a midpoint would probably be about the low 20%. Mm. But actually, Richard Thaler, the behavioural economist, was over uh, last week and was surprised how high our opt-out rate assumptions were. Mm. He thought that would be much, much fewer people mm. would opt out. We'll see. We'll see. We will indeed. Well, to move, to move on from sort of the nest and arrival of auto enrolment, um, just looking at a bit more broadly at... at Define benefits in those areas. I mean, is there anything in the panel's opinion that would help, that could actually be done about reducing the red tape around this? I mean, it's an endless repetitive theme. Everybody says it needs to be done. 
Well, if you, if you had your wish list, what do you think you could practically do? Jo? Well, I think our wish list would probably take up the entirety of this <laughs> film. Um, but I mean, we do have some hope uh, over the horizon because the government has embarked on a red tape challenge mm. and is focusing its spotlight on pensions as we speak. And I think there is an awful lot the government can do. I think we calculated that since 1995, there's been something like a 1,000 regulations passed on pensions across the piece, not just from the Department for Work and Pensions, but across the piece. And that's a very, very high number indeed. So I think there is scope to reduce some of the red, red tape that sits around pensions. And I think we're also enthused about um, Steve Webb, the pensions minister's proposals for defined ambition mm. pension schemes, which sort of sit somewhere in the middle between pure DB on the one hand and pure DC mm. on the other. And I think there is uh, some potential scope in there to do an awful lot of good that helps those employers with defined benefit pension schemes maybe pair back on some of the benefits, but still nonetheless give employees the certainty of getting a pension related to their salary, but perhaps also gives people in pure DB schemes, a bit more, DC schemes, a bit more certainty yeah. as well. So that's a very sort of fresh debate, but I think there's a lot yeah. uh, that the government can do there. We'll, we'll come back to defined ambition in a second, but in terms of, you know, if you could remove a bit of existing red tape, that will make a real difference? It's probably not so much about uh, red red tape, it's, it's probably more about the certainty at retirement. When we, when we engage people around their the retirement planning, they need a bit of certainty in terms of a base to plan from. Mm. And that, that's what you get with the, you know, the, the DB arrangements. And I think a lot of employers are going to struggle at the moment with uh, you know, the, the mortality risk and the investment risks in the current uh, volatile markets that we're in. Um, so so you know, the defined ambition scheme is, 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 a, is a good concept to look at. Cash balance schemes are another good concept where at least you have certainty around the lump sum you will have to buy a pension when you come to retire. But we need to give people some sort of certainty on which to base the retirement plans. That, that would seem to be the key for me. Yep. No, absolutely. I, I agree, absolutely. I think the major thing with defined benefit is it's, there are some demographic changes that you just cannot, you have to face to, and, and, you know, and, and it is just a fact of life in itself. Um, the problem with DB was that the proposition, when it, come, it first started, it looked a lot like what um, you know, uh, the minister has been talking about DA or different ambitions now. Um, and the problem has been that the right type has been sort of taking over and combining those demographic changes and not allowing a lot of the schemes to adapt to, um, to those changes uh, as, as they went forward. So mm -hmm. things around retirement ages, things around sort of uh, full indexation of benefits, etc. So to be fair, from, from our perspective, we think some employers will continue to offer DB and they're able to continue to do so and they wish to do so and, 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 and we continue to encourage them because it, it is obviously the best form of, of pension available. But DB is also becoming increasingly an actual bigger sort of financial problem for the employer, even if the scheme is already closed. So it's not just about keeping the DB scheme open or how can we keep them open, because frankly, it'll be, it'll be quite difficult for, for the majority of employers. But it's also, even if you close the scheme, it still has a big impact on how the employer is able to invest money sure. into the business and continue to grow the economy. So, you know, the DB debate doesn't stop at the moment that you close the scheme, but rather mm -hmm. there is a big legacy issue that has to be addressed. And, and we hope the Red Tape Challenge actually focuses on both sides, and mm -hmm. yes, how can we keep some of the incentives to keep DB open in the future, but also how could those employees have a closer scheme be able to continue to invest mm -hmm. in, the, in the wider economy? Do, do you think we've reached the stage where all DB schemes have closed to new members? Mm -hmm. I, I don't think so. I think there are some employers who are very much committed. I mean, obviously, a clear example is, is, is been Tesco. You know, Tesco is um, it's, it's an employer that ha are very much committed to the DB scheme mm -hmm. and they would like to continue to do it. And, you know, they have the business model allows them to do so. Mm -hmm. And there are other employers that just simply, it, it just changes whether the cash flow is, is lower than, than it would mm -hmm. be or, the, or the, the profile of the workforce is different. So, you know, we don't see, um, despite the fact that the defined benefit as it is obviously offers the, the, the most security to the member, mm -hmm. um, it doesn't mean that it should, it should be the only option and we should be exploring other options because of the, of the demographic change we cannot, um, we cannot do anything about. Yep. Caroline, what would your ambition for red tape be if you were given a free hand? Given a free no, hand? No minister or two. <laughs> oh, um, well, it, it's probably not the minister that's stopping us. It's those of us that look at the red tape and actually sort of get beneath the regulations of which as John says, there are many, 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 and understand why they're there. Mm. I mean, I think we would all like uh, less regulation. Uh, we are open to ideas. We have some areas where we know that we're going to be able to reduce regulation around things like information provision. Mm -hmm. um, we're looking to rationalise the regulations around that. 
And there are other areas that we're looking at. Mm. Uh, we've done quite a lot of work to bring together stakeholders like NAPF, CBI and others um, to work through areas that we might focus in on. And we're going through that at the moment. Mm. Uh, we would all dearly love a simpler system. Um, and this, is, I think, is where it links to, to the defined ambition pension. One of the things that Steve is, Steve is very, very keen to do is to develop a pension which shares risk but does it in a light touch hmm. way so that we don't reinvent DB with all the weight of hmm. regulation, that we do try and come up with something where the risk is shared but the regulation isn't so huge that it sinks it and importantly it remains simple enough for people to hmm. understand it. So. But does that mean we'll end up with something that is defined as a defined ambition pension or will there be a whole sort of palette of options within that? There are various end. different sorts of guarantee yeah. you could offer, various different sorts of discretion you could have in place. The ambition for defined, defined ambition, ambition is very much towards the latter. Well, the palette. Yes, mm -hmm. rather than a single uh, product or regime but we're at very, very early stages mm. on it so far, and all ideas gratefully <laughs> received. Yeah, right. Palette? Yeah, I, th I think that's right. You know, if you sort of look across the, the piece, there are, as I said, you know, pure DB schemes on the one hand, uh, pure DC schemes on the other, mm. and lots of other things in between. You mm. mentioned a uh, cash balance scheme. If we look across, you know, look, look across to Europe, the mm. Dutch have their uh, CDC, their collective DC schemes. Uh, which are sort of DB, sort of DC. They're a real sort of hybrid. Uh, the Germans have uh, this thing called the Riester Plan, which is a, a DC scheme, but which is underpinned by an investment guarantee. Mm. So there's quite a lot of, you know, there's quite a spectrum there. Mm. And I think it's important that in this discussion and debate around defined ambition, that we do think quite creatively about what could sit within that defined ambition. Mm. I don't think it is a one-size-fits-all. I think if we go down a one-size-fits-all rule, then mm. in five or ten years' time, there'll yeah. be a group of people sat around saying, yeah. aren't there too many rules and regulations around yeah. defined ambition? So I think we do have to sort of be a bit more flexible, but we do have to go back to thinking about those bits of the system that we must regulate mm. and where, re where only regulation can add to uh, investor and consumer protection. And those were actually... The governance system, you mentioned governance earlier, can come into play and we can go back to trusting the trustee in trust-based schemes or putting in place governance arrangements that ensure that members are protected and which don't require such onerous and very prescriptive regulation and legislation. Right. seems to me there's, there's two bits here in that one is could you develop a defined ambition scheme that in a sense would provide a, a way out for you know, existing DB schemes who want to give up. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so we don't get what we've seen over the last decade, which is all you know, the employer having all the risks and suddenly all the risks yeah, being transferred to the employee. Yeah. So that there's kind of the escape route for the remainder of DB where it, they want an escape route. But the other bit is, can you actually rebuild employer provision you know, back towards a, having an element of defined benefit in it? And do you actually think that's practical? Do you think employers will buy that? They, will, they will want to re-enter a market they've left? That's a, an assumption that I think a lot of us had made up until very recently where we've been talking to a lot of employers and there is certainly an interest if not an appetite for looking at some form of better pension provision yeah. than the basic DC. Now that's not to say they're all going to pick up and run with it but I certainly think there's an interest out there sufficient to warrant us doing further work on it and try and come up with some proposals. And it links very much to this question about legislation and regulation. At the moment, for example, if you want to offer a cash balance scheme, you are regulated as if you are a pure mm. DB scheme, mm. having to pay the full pen protection levy and so on. And that doesn't seem quite right. So I think, it, I think the appetite amongst employers, and Mario will have more to say about this, mm. I, I guess, than me, but might depend on exactly what the shape of... Yep. the defined ambition yes. looks like and what the regulation is that sits around it. And I think it's also about the certainty around it. I mean, the DB, a lot of employers have been quite burned by the DB experience mm -hmm. in a sense of seeing, as I mentioned, a proposal that was pretty flexible at some point and it has evolved into a quite complex web. So what we really need is, in a sense, a commitment from the politics side of this mm. to say we will put in place a framework that has certain red lines which says we will not get out of this 
and then employees, if they feel that they can trust that, then they will explore it because, you know, I think as Caroline said, there is an appetite to do better food. Because, it, you know, within British business, there's a very strong paternalistic feeling towards employees still today. That, you know, ultimately, you need to be solvent employer to be able to offer a, mm. a, a, a pension. And mm. therefore, you know, it is about your business first mm. and then the, the benefits you can offer within that business. So if, if a government or the political environment altogether can't, say to employees, we will provide you with this and it will not change further down the line when there is a different government or different parliament or whichever, uh, then we could see some employers really considering exploring this form. Yeah. And do you have clients who are saying, we'd like to do more? You know, we've come out of DV, but we'd like, you know, but now we're in QDC, we'd like to do more? You, you have, um, you certainly have clients that are very generous um, compared to clients that are less generous. Mm. We, we don't have clients that are uh, proactively coming up with uh, new, new types of pension scheme. I think that's probably beyond most HR and employee, mm, sure. employee benefit yeah. directors. But uh, I mean, the, the big challenge for, for, for me is someone that's probably going to have to manufacture one of these things. That's my day job. And my, my customers, the employers, expect me to be able to administer the thing effectively and to engage with their workforce effectively. So for me, it's important that if we come up with a solution, it's something that's not going to cost a fortune to run because there's a tremendous pressure to drive charges down, which is quite correct. Mm. And the second thing is it can't be overly complicated because we're not going to succeed in engaging the workforce unless, unless we get it at a level mm. that people can understand. Yep. Well, you having mentioned charges, that brings us to charges. Um, I mean, do we need a code of conduct on charging? Do we need some regulation? Do we need a maximum charge? What do we need to do about charges? Well, Apart I, from get them, well, get them down. But. Well, I, I certainly think what we need is, is a code of conduct on charges so that we talked about transparency earlier and, and employee engagement and communication. I think it is vitally important in a world of auto-enrolment where we're really going to be also enrolling people into defined contribution schemes, that people have a good sense about how much they're being charged and what they're being charged mm. for. And that's why the NAPF has been leading work to develop a code of conduct with the CBI, with the ABI, with representatives from the investment management industry, from consumer groups, to really get a, a broad church of uh, stakeholders um, and with, with the support of government to really work up a, an industry code of practice. Mm. Now, we're currently consulting on that. The feedback we've had so far has been very positive. But I think it is important that actually this is an area where the industry gets its own house in order. Mm. Because I'm pretty certain if we don't, then actually that one will be one extra piece of legislation and regulation that does get added. And you know, I think it's incumbent upon us to get our own act together and to get our own house in order. So we're putting together a code of practice primarily aimed at employers at this stage because you know the first step really is getting all those 1.3 million employers through auto enrolment. Lots of employers will be choosing pensions for the first time. They'll be as new to pensions mm. as their employees. Mm. They want to be able to choose a good pension for their workforce. They want to be able to compare you know, insurance company with insurance company with insurance company with Nest or People's Pension or Now or any of these others that we've discussed in a consistent fashion. Mm. At the moment, that's simply not mm. possible. So that's what our code of practice aims to do, and I very much hope that we'll see that published before the end of this year uh, with the full support of and will, everybody. Well, this gets to all the sort of hidden charges as well, because you know we all know those headlines. And well, what we're aiming what to goes do on is the hood, out of which people have made a lot of money over the years, indeed, and therefore won't, won't cheerfully give it up. And you won't be surprised to know that this has been one of the very contentious uh, elements that have been discussed as, as we've drawn together this code. But what we want is a, co is a code that is as comprehensive as possible in terms of the charge it covers. But um, defining exactly what a charge is is enormously controversial mm. and complicated. And there is no simple answer, sad though I am to say that. Um, so we do, it will be as comprehensive as it possibly can be. Yeah. What's it look like from your point of view? Well, we're uh, very supportive of the work uh, done by the NEPF. We think it's uh, an excellent piece of work and uh, right behind the principles. I think it's important, as I go back to what I said earlier, that we believe in informed choice and a level playing field. As Joan mentions, there's an awful lot of uh, complicated charging structures out there these days. They're not, it's difficult to compare them on a like-for-like -like basis. And similarly, you get a, a broad range of services. Mm -hmm. So some of the more expensive pensions do come with a broader range of services. But it, it's right that people have a like-for-like -like basis of understanding uh, each, each scheme or each provider and what, what's being provided for that money. I think mm -hmm. value for money is the, is, is the key phrase. 
Um, and I think, I think it's important that we try and look at the total effect of charges. So, so the, the cost of running the scheme, the cost of the investment funds, including some of the costs that have been taken out within the investment funds, which aren't easy to disclose. Mm. Um, it's, it's important that, that, uh, that consumers and employers know the total effect of, of all the charges that have been taken out, who's taking them out. For, for example, financial advisors uh, often take charges out of pension schemes. The employer should know who's, who's taking what charges out and what, what that mm. money has been used for. Mm. Yeah, and I absolutely agree with that because I think the main thing is we need, there is definitely room for improvement on, on the charging side and that's why we're, we're helping um, mm -hmm. an APF in this area as part of, as part of the working group on, on, the, on the code. I think the main thing is, is the value for money proposition and we need to understand that lower charges uh, in itself doesn't mean better service mm -hmm. and there has to be a trade-off that certainly charges has been given bad, really bad publicity to the industry mm -hmm. and it's probably the main area where you know we need to do some work um, quickly to make sure that um, auto enrollment is not discredited from anyone. Um, but having said that we need to make sure that there is some comparisons at the level but at the same time we need to make sure that there is for those employers or those employees that want something that's a bit more tailored uh, or, or that has, you know, if you're paying more for something, then it should be a reason why you're getting a, a better service out of that. Mm. Um, so what you need to be able to say is disclose the charges in a way that you understand where your money is going and what it is mm. paying for, rather than saying, I have a very low charge, mm. because a very low charge might mean that you're getting not such a good service. So the idea is, what am I paying for? What is that money going for? And it's actually value for money altogether. Mm -hmm. And if we can get that, and I'm confident that you know, the work that the NAPF has been doing with, with the industry, you know, we can get that at that point. But we need to make sure that we don't oversimplify the entire process saying, if it's low charge, it's a good scheme, because mm -hmm. probably that's not going to be the case all the time. Okay. Well, I agree with uh, all that's been said, but I mean, just on Mario's point, um, we do have to remember the impact that charges mm -hmm. can have on a pension mm. fund and the sort of people we're bringing into automatic enrolment are likely to be people on low income with very small pension funds mm. and the difference between a few basis points can be very very mm. significant sure. so i think charges matter i think we're all agreed that that charges matter uh, and we very much support the napf initiative and uh, i think you know this way forward of the industry putting together a code of conduct that they sign up to is very much the way we'd like to see things. We've just recently, uh, the industry's published a code of conduct on incentivised transfers, mm. produced in the same sort of way. Mm. And again, we're watching, it's a very important area. If we have to, we will take regulation, but we'd much rather not, because if the industry are prepared to, to sort it out for themselves, mm. we're going to get a much better solution, we think. And if we end up with the code of conduct, do we have? Will there be some way of monitoring it and and sort of, you know, naming and shaming those who don't honour it, so to speak? Because, well, I mean, certainly monitoring is is built into the the code, and it will mm. be for others to to name and shame. But but you know, the the outputs of that will be pretty clear to see for select committees, for politicians, for journalists. Mm -hmm. uh, so so you know that sort of ability to to name and shame, as you call it, mm. w will be much more. Uh, apparent than mm. it currently is, where, you know, frankly, it is yeah. extremely uh, difficult to, mm. to see who's charging what and what for. So, yeah. um, you know, I think if we can get some sort of like-for-like -like comparison, mm. it is easier to see. Mm. And it is easier to see whether people are really getting value for money, because I very much take Caroline's point that, you know, every penny counts, every pound mm. that's going out in charges is money that's not going out in pension at the end of the day. And for the sort of mass audience that we're trying to bring in through auto-enrolment, Frankly, lots of them are going to have pretty straightforward needs. Mm. Most of them will go into the default funds. Most of them are going to have pretty straightforward needs. Mm. So uh, we mustn't sort of over-invent what we're trying to do, mm. you know, cast our minds back to stakeholder pensions and how that started off as a pretty simple product but got kind of over-elaborated. Mm. Uh, so we mustn't fall into that trap again. Right. And, and, and clearly one of the attractions in the effective code of conduct is you don't need to regulate. If you do regulate, it's not easy to regulate in this area. No, it's it? not. Because, because you end up with, a, you put in a, in a rule, everybody charges up to it. Exactly. Yeah. It has perverse consequences, yeah. and that's what we want to avoid. Yeah. So much, much better that we have a code of conduct that's not just looking at the level of charges, but what makes up the charges. And that's mm. really important, that there is transparency, that people can compare them and that we can keep the charges low. And I mean, the one thing that I think we are starting to see is charges are coming down, mm. which is great. And I hope that that will continue. Yeah. 
Right, well, just for the final question around this, is there anything left that we haven't really talked about so far that uh, the panel would like to see the government address as a way of easing pension reform? Mario? Um, I think one area where we've seen the impact very much at the moment because of the current, uh, the current economic situation has been the impact that quantitative easing has been having on um, there's scheme valuations and obviously the fact that we're going through the second three and evalu third three and evaluation of, of schemes. Um, the regulator has put out a statement where he said, you know, the quantitative incident impact should be taken into account when it comes to recovery plans. What we haven't seen is what it doesn't address is the issue with the impact it actually has on technical provisions. And technical provisions is a fundamental part of the of the proposition because it is what it is, um, what impact employs to actually be able to uh, refinance themselves, uh, the outlook that it has on the market for the company, etc., the strength of the company and, and, and how investors see it. Mm -hmm. So something that we have um, put forward in our right of challenge submission and something that we would like government to sort of um, explore is the idea of looking at some smoothing into the discount rate used for uh, defined benefit. It is being done in the Netherlands, it's been done in Denmark. Uh, so obviously other members, uh, other members say within the EU are doing it. Uh, so whether it is something that we should be looking at in the UK particularly because the impact QE has been having on, on, on our pension skills. Yeah. Right. Pete? I think for me, we're, uh, we're looking at a fairly large logistical challenge, as I mentioned earlier, uh, and also uh, a big challenge in terms of employee engagement. And there's an awful lot of great work that's going on across the industry in terms of building technology platforms and researching what sort of employee engagement is going to be really effective. So the key, I think, for the next couple of years is to, is to keep a, a steady state of affairs. There's lots of things we could do to, to enhance uh, simplification benefits and to maybe think about moving people up from, from 8%. But let, let's keep a steady state of affairs for a couple of years, mm -hmm. get things as they are embedded, and then learn from good practice, I think, uh, after that. Joanne, one wish. Uh, I'd certainly echo Mario's point on QE. I guess my one, one other wish would be that the government keeps, uh, keeps firm on Europe and, and uh, opposing proposals to introduce new solvency yeah. rules, new funding standards on defined benefit pensions and occupational pensions in the UK because then we'll be having a whole different conversation mm, about yeah. whether DB, because frankly there won't be any uh, for, for us to have. So you know, to, to make sure the government you know, really keep... Uh, firm on opposing mm. the introduction of new solvency rules for occupational pension and schemes. Are you optimistic they'll succeed? Because it's kind of us against everybody else. Because well, everybody else doesn't understand us and what we're trying to do. Well, it's kind of us, the Dutch, the Irish, the Germans. So we're not okay. entirely right. uh, alone on this one. Um, but you know, clearly we would like more mem member states that do have defined benefit pension schemes, perhaps not quite in the scale that we do, but do have defined benefit pension schemes to join us. And um, you know, I know that we're working, the government's working, the CBI, the ABI in, in the UK is very opposed to this and we are working as one but making sure that we stay united on that mm. and work with our colleagues elsewhere in Europe is going to be vitally important but also making sure we've got the backing of the government on this, mm. which, which I'm very pleased to say on this we do. You do indeed. That's right. an easy one to answer. Oh, <laughs> we will continue to, <laughs> to work as one on that. I think my wish is... Um, a little bit as Pete said really, that we, we with the industry in its widest sense continue to work together to make a success of the reforms because I think the prize, if we get it right, is enormous um, and it will be tempting to look at it as we start to go live later this year and when something doesn't look quite right, twiddle with it. Uh, generally, I think we do need to sort of stay calm and let it take its course, obviously learning from what's happening, spreading best practice, uh, but generally working together to, to, to maintain, I think, the unprecedented consensus we've had around these reforms to make a success of them. Right. Well, let's hope indeed they do prove so. And that just leaves it to me to, to thank our panel, Pete Clancy, Joanne Seegers, Caroline Rooks and Mario Lopez, and to thank you for watching. Thank you.